I'm coming to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts on a lovely midday in June, all things considered. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk today. And um, I'll do my best to cover the questions that were presented to me. Um, but I will admit that these questions are um, quite big. Uh, these were the prompts that were given to me. And I will attempt to answer them in some form or another. Um, although uh, multiple dissertations lie in the questions that are put for me today. Um, so my approach essentially to answer these questions is uh, to first talk a little bit about this idea of congestion, giving a traditional perspective, um, and then um, talking about this concept of accessibility, which is quite related to this and related to, in fact, the fundamental question of agglomeration, why we come together, why cities exist. Um, then I'll talk a bit about some of the push-pull forces that are driving um, uh, urbanization today, as evidenced in, for example, the case of um, Mexico City, um, and then provide a perspective from my own town, Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, part of the greater Boston metropolitan area, which I sh actually I like to share as an example of how we can take advantage of congestion and agglomeration in a positive way towards um, hopefully beneficial outcomes, recognizing, of course, that um, it's a relatively unique place in the global landscape. Um, and then I do, I can't um, resist but end with a few parting thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, we already saw the images of congestion, right? Um, everyone's familiar with these in whatever town they come from. When you first hear about congestion, this is probably what comes to mind. What I liked about the, um, the invitation from the Strelka Institute was, in fact, their thinking about congestion in multiple dimensions. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this first of how kind of a traditional transportation planner views congestion. Um, some of you might, might be familiar with the, uh, a company called Inrix. It's actually a US-based company that uses data sources to assess traffic congestions, congestion. And they have, um, in the last five years, I believe, started publishing this global index of traffic congestion. So you can see, for example, that Mexico City is up here. This is the most recent one. I'm surprised that I don't see Moscow up here, but you know, my, my, my home metropolitan area, Boston, is here. And these are cities we're all familiar with um, in some form or another. Um, and these are the most congested cities in the world. But it's, I think it's important that we consider what is it we're measuring when we measure congestion. Now, I won't get into the technical details of in how INREX does its calculations, but essentially they measure the amount of time spent in peak period versus what, how much time it would take if you were on free flow conditions, meaning that there was nobody else on the roadway. Now, that's clearly, in my opinion, a poor benchmark because, well, if you built enough roadways such that everyone could travel freely, well, you've definitely built too many roadways. Um, now, this is a, a very stylized description of how a traffic, a traffic engineer might look at congestion while we're trying to maximize the flow of vehicles per hour. And this is kind of correlated with, I mean, this is related to some amount of density on the uh, vehicles on the streets, and we're trying to find this optimal point. Um, uh, I think it's also worth noting, however, how a transportation economist or an economist might view congestion, because here the the, 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 I apologize for the both poor graphics and probably slightly complicated um, visualization here for those that aren't used to kind of supply and demand curves. But essentially, congestion is a social cost, and it's, in theory, identifiable, and also, in theory, it can be taxed away. And um, that would be known as a congestion charge or a, a, a fee that's charged on vehicles that would bring down congestion to an economically efficient level. Um, this is the view of congestion that I actually personally consider the one we should be thinking about when we think of transportation congestion. However, I also want to ask, are we just asking the wrong question? Now, I'm not denying that this is not, I'm not denying that this is, is not important that there's an economic loss here, but I think the focus on transportation congestion can make us think about the wrong thing because what do we actually want from our cities? I would argue what we really want from our cities is accessibility. Um, 
or as some have said, essentially the extent to which our urban systems or our land use and transportation systems allow us to do the things we want to do in cities. Um, and when you think about it this way, it's a lot, there's a lot more components which enable our metropolitan areas or the cities, the settlements, the places that we live to actually give us that which we want. So of course, the mobility system with, the, this is a highly stylized um, uh, table, but, and so, if you hold all else in equal, if you improve speed, if you have more links, if you have cheaper services, of course, when you have more mobility, you have more accessibility. When you change the spatial distribution of the things we're trying to get to, if you, for example, increase the proximity amongst opportunities, accessibility is also increased. Our own attributes, our own ability to take advantage of the opportunities, also increases accessibility, as does the quality of those opportunities and their prices and so forth. Um, but of course, telecommunication systems every day we're experiencing more and more enhance our accessibility because we're, for example, in this event today, gaining access to new information. Hopefully some of it is of quality and we're all doing it from probably most of us, our own homes. Um, and so if you think about this in very crude summary, ignoring the individual component, if the ends is what I'm saying is what we're trying to get, accessibility, well, you can get this through enhanced mobility, through enhanced proximity, and or through enhanced connectivity. Um, and there is this trade-off inherent between a mobility and proximity, as kind of uh, uh, it's alluded to in Antonia's um, presentation in Mexico City, because the more space that you occupy to increase throughput for vehicles, the greater the mobility infrastructure, by definition, the further away everything else has to be because mobility consumes space unless you put it underground. Now, if we return to that, um, the, the, the congestion index, and I apologize, this slide is um, um, a somewhat uh, dense, but I'll try to talk through it quickly. Um, first of all, this is, again, comparing two different congestion indices. One is INRICS. It's a slightly more dated one than the one I just showed, and it's for United States cities only. Another congestion index, which has been generated for decades in the United States, called the TTI. Um, and those first two columns show the poorest performing cities in the United States in terms of how congested they are. And, you know, there's some difference depending on how you measure it, but you can see the top in terms of jobs accessibility measured by the number of jobs people can get to and um, by amount of proximity because of density. Okay, so hopefully that was a, a reasonable background to this idea of accessibility and the different ways you can view uh, concepts of congestion and density. Um, now, let's step back a little and, and ask, well, why are we coming together in the first place? Why do we have these massive metropolitan areas? Well, they exist essentially because they reduce our costs of gaining accessibility. Um, Ed Glazer, the Harvard urban economist, has said all of the benefits of cities come ultimately from the reduced transport costs for goods, people, and ideas. And I want to emphasize ideas because they're very important in kind of the knowledge generation economies that, we, that thrive today. Um, I won't belabor this too much, but if you think about um, why, why we come together, there's both benefits to people and households and benefits to firms. Um, these can basically be broken down into advanced increased productivity, thus we have more, more earnings and we um, um, firms get higher product, marginal productivity of labor, increased specialization of labor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a number of both financial and economic as well as other social opportunities that we Take, are able to take advantage of, um, and that coming together in agglomerations provide us. Um, I wanted to take a moment uh, to talk about this last point in um, the firms, which is this idea of information sp spillovers um, and this idea of knowledge economies. You can these date back to the um, economist, uh, the British economist Marshall, um, who basically, you know, said there's something in the air. There's these mysteries of the trade. Why do firms come together? Why do they cluster? Um, and it's um, essentially there's some value to economic productivity. These can be informational spillovers. They're very hard to identify in practice. But in fact, I'll talk a little bit about why we um, um, how these manifest themselves in metropolitan areas using the vignette of the Cambridge uh, metropolitan area. 
Um, but essentially, if if um, I think it's best illustrated in this diagram here, where you have certain types of activities, um, you know, if you if you consider the zero on this distance from a node to be a concentration uh, in a central business district, you have um, the forms of knowledge that are hard to translate except through deep, intense negotiation, through non-codifiable knowledge, through um, information that requires face-to-face -face communication. And this is, in fact, the most valuable information. This requires us to move as people, and this means that um, we're very expensive to transport. And so there's a certain value, especially for high-value propositions, high-value negotiations, high-value enterprises that require us to be near each other. Um, um, and I apologize for having to go through this too quickly in the interest of time. But of course, we don't just come together. We are, our metropolitan areas are being ever sprawled out into the hinterland, as we saw in the case of Mexico City. These are the so-called centrifugal forces, those that are pushing apart. Um, they include um, pollution, uh, congestion, um, noise pollution, a range of social, political, and cultural forces, and of course, our own both firms and households' willingness and preferences to pay. So when you get richer, you want more space. When you get richer, you prefer private mobility. When you get richer, you prefer more green space, um, and you're able to pay for this. Um, transportation infrastructure is under, underlies some of this as well, because again, this is a diagram that probably will take too long to talk through, but if you build a transportation investment, if your red line here is the initial um, starting point and you build a new transportation investment, which reduces the cost of transportation, you, you decrease the value for being in that central business district, and you also increase the, um, the, the urban area boundary. And so you make it more attractive and um, more um, um, accessible for people to, or firms to go live into the hinterland. This has been a phenomenon in the United States for decades, um, and evidence suggests that over time, in the United States anyway, the journey to work has not really gone up because both people and then households move outward. And so even if congestion has gotten worse, um, overall, the amount of time that people are spending to get to work has not really gotten any worse on average. Now, um, I, I was trying to answer this question of uh, at, at the very beginning that was posed about the, the environmental and, and other effects of, of, of densities and congestion and agglomeration. And um, I put up here a, a study, which is very interesting. It's in the German, Journal of Urban Economics. It's published, published last year. And they looked at um, a meta-analysis of studies in the U developed world. So in industrialized countries, and they find um, analyzing about 115 uh, different outcomes of density or urban outcomes, including wages, the patent intensity, which is a measure of the knowledge uh, economies, the, the, the information economy, the innovation of a, a metropolitan area. Um, a VMT is a vehicle miles traveled. So this is the amount of travel by private vehicles. Um, and a no number of other indicators, including pollution, green area density, crime rate, and so forth. And they find that overall density is a net amenity, that there are benefits and there are costs, but overall, density is good. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, some pollution does, not, does go up, pollution exposure goes up, but overall energy use, for example, goes down. Um, travel speeds go up. Um, I'm sorry, travel time goes up, speed goes down, but overall car use goes up, down. Um, 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 overall amount of vehicle miles traveled goes down and so forth. Um, of course, the, there's problems with the distribution of this. This is something that's very evident in the United States over in the last 20 years of urbanization because um, cities have become more and more unequal. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in some of the metrics that are measured here, especially urban inequality, health and well-being. Um, I think I'm probably uh, close to over my time, but I will ask for maybe two more minutes to try to bring this all home, at least to my home, to the city I live in, because I do think it offers an interesting perspective on how um, some of these forces uh, play out. Um, so this is Kendall Square. I don't know, for those of you that might be familiar, so this is downtown Boston. This is around 1980. This here, if you can see my, uh, um, my mouse, is where MIT is. 
right along the Charles River. This entire area at the time, you can see, was nothing. Um, except for a U.S. A government department of a public, a public trans, a department of transportation building here, this is Kendall Square roughly today. Um, actually, this image is probably from three or four years ago. Um, it's the, one of the most uh, the hottest real estate commercial real estate markets in the country, if not the world. Um, you know, subject to recent changes, and you can see the amount of density that has been put in here. Um, it's a highly, as I said, it's a very hot real estate market. Um, gets fetches very high rates. Um, it's also highly innovative in terms of that last row there is the kind of density of innovation, again, consistent with this measurement of like, does density generate innovation? Um, now, this is once more this idea of, of, of firms apparently willing to bid to be proximate to each other because of the value of informational spillovers that um, uh, having high concentrations of brain power um, seem to enable. Now, I think this is important to the perspective of congestion because, in fact, with the amount of square meters of construction of commercial space, for example, that happened over the past decade, no traffic increased. So there was no congestion. There may have been congestion of ideas. There was a huge amount of knowledge spillover, but there was actually no increase in traffic. There's elements of success here, which include the densification of commercial development, the densification of housing, the mixed use, um, the mix of uses, a design of the physical space, public amenities, and et cetera. Um, I'll just run through a few indicators here that tra motorized traffic in Cambridge has actually been going down over the past and over the same time period. Um, Cambridge is uh, the most human powered city in the United States of the large cities. Um, there's been increase in um, people and workers uh, uh, using bicycle, uh, both residents and workers that, that ride uh, by bicycle. Um, there's actually been a decrease in the amount of parking, um, and there's actually been a decrease in the total number of vehicles per household um, over this time period. Um, so I think, you know, there's a number of things that are going on here. You cannot attribute this entirely to urban design nor the urban policies, but I think it's a combination of factors that, you know, you by certain forms of development, you attract types of firms and types of people that actually change the culture and the behaviors of the people that work here. There's definitely explicit government policy about mobility management, about providing bicycling infrastructure and designing streets for people. And then um, I believe, though, you know, I can't that verify this, that there actually was this government philosophy around trying to create spaces to generate social track capital and attract certain types of individuals. Um, uh, Donald Appleyard has this classic book from the early um, the 1980s that, you know, um, people can argue about some of the, 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 the data underlying it, but the fact that to enhance social capital, you want to have density of people, not vehicles. And so you want to create spaces where people can be dense, where you have congestion of people, but not congestion of vehicles. I um, mean, I believe that this has been part of uh, the underlying philosophy um, in the city of Cambridge. And this, of course, also translates to uh, lower speed traffic, which can have severe, um, severely important impacts on um, traffic safety. Um, and the quintessential example in the case of Cambridge is Mass Ave, which is the main spine that runs through the city and goes into the city of Boston, where they basically did a, a road diet and reduced from four to five lanes to two to three lanes across the entirety of the corridor without, again, any decline in the total number of vehicles that went through. So think back to that traffic engineer's uh, pers um, diagram I showed at the beginning. Um, I will uh, just want to end where, um, you know, I hate to you know, bring in the most recent public events, but I do think, uh, um, you know, what's going on in the larger world right now, um, you know, we do have these important questions that people are asking and that we must ask. So what is the future of density? What is the future of cities in the face of the pandemic we're currently living through? Um, so that's the public health pandemic, but also the broader racist, um, the, the broader social pandemic, which, you know, in the United States, we're dealing with an, the need to become an anti-racist society. And as a global society, I believe an anti-colonial society. So we have to figure out how the future of cities plays into this need. Um, and this is, of course, also linked to broad, uh, a global need for decarbonizing our economy. And, you know, um, I will end it there. And I thank you for your attention. I apologize if I spoke too quickly or too incoherently, um, and I'll blame it on this still getting used to this new form of 
conferencing, um, staring at my own laptop in my office at home. But thank you. Great, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. I really appreciate uh, all the details you brought up about transportation. Um, and I think it builds up really nicely from the conversation that we had um, a few weeks ago already. Um, so due to the interest of time, uh, I can only ask you one question, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, so just, just join from the presentation and also from our conversation. Um, I, really, I really think it's interesting how you approach um, transportation and mobility from, from your perspective as an economist. Um, so I think it's very interesting. And what I would like to ask you is, um, we just, you talk about the centripetal and the centrifugal forces of cities. Um, and then we talk about Mexico, which is, you know, it's sprawling, but it's also congested and there's all these things happening. And um, how there's these forces, forces that essentially push us apart, pull us back together. Um, so what I would like to know is that um, from your perspective as an economist, um, how do we factor in these forces into trying to stay away from externalizing all the negative uh, externalities onto the environment? And, and how can a city manage those forces um, and not necessarily you know, have to take it out on the environment? Is there some sort of value creation mechanism or what, what, would, what, would, you, what would you advise uh, a city planner? Um, well, it depends on the on the scale of the city planner, right? We don't. I, I, Mexico City, I think, is very similar to Greater Boston in this respect. We don't have a city planner. Mm -hmm. um, there is no planner for Greater Boston metropolitan area, um, and there is definitely no planner for the Greater Mexico City metropolitan area. There are hundreds of planners. There are. Many in you know Boston, we have 160 different municipalities. Mexico City, you have 60 or something. You know, of course, you have the powerful uh, Mexico City. We have the powerful downtown Boston, but it's still a relatively small player. So, I think you know the. I think that the Cambridge area is a good example. I mean, they have decidedly focused on urban development oriented around. Um, at the human scale, but it's still only operating at the margins in the metropolitan area for several factors. One, because we can't control what goes on around us. Although I do think there are spillovers in the sense that other metropolitan area, other parts of the metropolitan area are also moving towards micro mobility, moving towards human powered mobility and so forth. Um, but I don't think those that other more important issues that are relevant at the metropolitan scale can be handled by any single municipality. We cannot solve the housing crisis. We cannot solve the problem of uh, equality of access to good jobs. We cannot solve the problem on our own of um, decarbonizing our, our, our um, economic footprint. Um, so, uh, I don't have a easy answer to your question. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much. And I, that was a bit cruel on my side because I think it was a question that definitely requires more than a few minutes to answer. So hopefully we can engage in another conversation at another time. So thank you so much uh, for, for all your insights into this article and, and for your presentation um, and for being part of uh, this research project. Unfortunately, we have to move on um, to the next presentation. So thank you very much, uh, Christopher. Thanks.